Father, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to study your word. Um, and we pray that in the process of uh, going through, uh, again, challenging scriptures, challenging not only in interpretation, but in their uh, meaning and uh, just the, the feeling that we have when we go through some of these sad chapters in Israel's history. But Father, we come here to learn, to grow, to be students of your spirit, to guide us and direct us. We pray, Lord, that you would bless this time, use it to grow us to the men and women you've called us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, I'm going to make an announcement twice. This is the first, and then I'll make it a little later for people coming later or watching later. Um, and the announcement is uh, next week, Memorial Day, we are meeting. Now, by the way, I have a favor. Could somebody get me a glass of water? I feel a little uh, tickle on my throat. I would appreciate that. <coughs> Excuse me. So you don't have to come. <laughs> you can watch it online. But the reason why I'm pressing on is because, number one, I like it, so it's not a burden to me. But number two, and this is the, the real main reason, is I go on vacation um, on June 26, which is a Sunday. I want to finish this class before then, which would be June 20th, uh, 19th, something like that. Um, thank you so much, Bob. So I'm just, I measured it out as to, to doing two chapters a week. There is an offhand chance that I might be able to squeeze three chapters twice, um, you know, depending on the material, but I can't be sure of that. And so I thought I would just say, we'll have class on Memorial Day. And so in the morning, I'll be in the parade as the, one of the firemen, uh, chaplains. Um, and then in the evening, we'll teach the Bible. So even if it's just me here on Memorial Day, because you're eating hot dogs and hamburgers in your house, that's totally fine. But we will be meeting. At least I'll be here. And uh, you can watch later if you like on Facebook, or it'll be posted on the YouTube channel uh, the following day. Okay, with that in mind, let us go to our quiz and see what we can enjoy. Who should you want to grow up to be like? Who do you want to grow up to be like? When I grow up, I want to be like, like my father David, like my father Jehoaz, like my father Ahab, like my father Joash. And I hope this isn't too hard here for you. Like my father David. That's the one I want to aim to be like. All these others are degrees of loseriness. And so uh, Ahab is the worst on this list, but they all have their problems. But Ahab is probably the worst. David is the best. But always love to point this out. David is not a perfect man. He's far from it. But you know what? He always has a heart for God. That is what makes him stand out. That is what we appreciate. Number two. When King Amaziah exacted revenge for the death of his father, he, A, acted in passion, B, took into account the book of the law, C, acted capriciously, D, followed Solomon's example. Now, there could be a little trickiness here because I actually compared this king to Solomon in the sense that he starts well and crashes and burns near the end, but his general assessment is a decent king. But that's not the nature of the question. The question's nature is, what was the nature of his exacting revenge? And what was a very surprising, yes, Karen, you're amazing. Yay! Isn't she wonderful? She got it right. No, that is something worth celebrating. We, we do. Now, he took into account the book of the law. That statement is so rare with any of these kings. You know, I wanted to see what God had to say. Wow. You know what? That's rare among Christians. You know, when you're thinking about, I wonder what job I should take, or what, I wonder what this, I wonder what that. 
how many of us really wrestle with what does the Bible say about that? Because sometimes there's great wisdom to be gleaned about, you know, what position you have. I was sitting here right in the very first row of this church, praying with somebody after church, and he said this, Pastor, I chose the wrong career. I said, how so? I chose to be a lawyer. In my firm, we lie for a living, and it's destroying me. And now I don't know if he, I doubt when he was hiring there, they said, we just want you to be informed that we lie here in this law firm. But he just felt that he couldn't do it with the integrity that, you know, God called him to be. The fact that he consults the book of the law, great example for all of us. You know, what does the Bible have to say about that? Number three, who is associated with the chariots and horsemen of Israel? Kind of a tricky question, unless you remember the story. Joash, Elijah, Elisha, Amaziah. And this is when the king finds out that Elisha is dying. And he goes, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And so it is Elisha. Elisha. And so the idea was that at Elisha's word, they seem to win. At Elisha's word, they seem to lose. You know, so he associated the king, Elisha, with their victories. Um, so he is a, a strength and a power of Israel. Number four, which king did not get to be buried with the other Judean kings? Uzziah, Azariah, Zechariah, Jeroboam. Now, Barbara, you know that one? Okay, this is, this is a little tricky because there's actually two names here because the king goes by two names. Same guy. Uzziah and Azariah are the same king. Why was he buried separately? Well, the text doesn't overtly say, but it seems to be implied because of his leprosy. Um, and because of the leprosy, he was separate from Jerusalem all of his reign after the leprosy broke out. And that probably followed through with his burial. So um, it is the same person, but with two different names. And one of the reasons why we think he's given the two different names is because there was a high priest at the time named Azariah, who's going to come up tonight uh, indirectly because he was a strong high priest. And tonight we're going to bump into a wimpy high priest. And uh, we'll explain what we mean by that a little bit later. Number five, which king contracted leprosy? Oops, I gave that one. So I hope somebody was listening to that. And the answer is Uzziah, Uzziah. And uh, that is the answer. <laughs> we'll, we'll remind ourselves of that story a little bit later tonight, too. Number six, Pul, king of Assyria, is also known as Sennacherib, Lord of the Flies, Tiglath Pilzer III, Pekahiah. And the name is Tiglath Pilzer III. He is a name that comes down from history to us independently of Scripture. A very important and dominant king in world history. Um, but in the beginning, when he's first mentioned, his name is Pull. Okay, number seven. Which evil king of Israel... Now, we could put evil king with every king of Israel. But which really evil king of Israel... Ripped open pregnant women. I mean, when you read that phrase, it's, it's like, it's hard to even read. Shulam, Pika, Manahem, Zechariah. Anyone? Shulam. Shulam. Yeah, very good, Mary. Glad to see it. She's still got it. Don't doubt her. She can figure it out. 
You know what? She is an example. I, I, when I preached on Sunday, I said to folks, because I was preaching on how to study the Bible, but one of the things I challenged people was to memorize. And I don't know how many times people have come up to me and said, oh, Pastor Steve, I can't memorize anything. To which I will point out, my sister Mary, you know, she doesn't actually credit herself for being a good memory verse person. But you know what? She remembers this. And you know what? If my sister Mary can remember it at a, she hates when I say her you know, age, but at a, at a healthy, ripe age, so can we. <laughs> it, it's not that you're going to need to memorize the entire chapter, but I tell you, there are some verses worth memorizing. I sense some humor coming on the side of the room here. <laughs> okay. I just really find memory, memorizing verses so helpful in my own journey because, you know, you could be anywhere on a New York subway, driving on the LAE, riding on my scooter, you know, and, and the verse can be used by the Holy Spirit, just pops into your head and you go, yeah, Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And that's good. Uh, I gave an example, which Bill will remember from yesterday, but does anyone know? I doubt it. <laughs> Here's my low doubt for this room here. Um, Psalm chapter 20, verse 7. So if you pay attention to Wall Street over the last two weeks, where you feel like the roller coaster only goes down, you know, I'm waiting for the up, but it just keeps going down. The Lord reminded me of Psalm chapter 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord. And uh, you were at the uh, senior group, and I brought that verse up because the Lord has been giving me that verse a lot over the last two weeks. But I'm grateful for things like that. I have hidden his word in my heart, and it, and it helps. It really does. You know, it also helps, I mean, from a preacher perspective. When a preacher can rattle off verses... It does convey to congregants, I guess he takes it seriously, that he's taken the time to memorize. Now, I, I think it's a subtle message, but I personally think it can be an important message because I'm in need of this stuff like anyone else is in need of this stuff. And so I hope there is a person or two who says, if he can do it, I can do it, you know, because I'm no brainiac, but, you know, I can take the time to, to learn. All right. So thank you, Mary, for the answer of that question. So that was my rabbit trail because of Mary's brilliance. Number eight, which king of Israel was evil, but was a highly effective king? Shulam, Jeroboam II, Menahem, Zechariah. And the answer is Jeroboam II. And what's interesting about these descriptions when, they, when the Bible says that, it doesn't say much about their reign. We actually have to find that information out often from other sources. Because as the Bible writers think, you don't measure success by, oh, he increased his empire. He really expanded. Boy, was that guy rich. You know what really increases your reputation biblically is you loved the Lord. And you know what? That goes a lot with church ministries, too. You know, you could have a pastor of a very small church, but you know what? That church was stable. That church grew in love and omniscient of the Lord. And at the end of that person's pastorate, the Lord's probably going, well done, good and faithful servant. But you can have another guy who grew his church to huge proportions, and the Lord says, it's time for him to go. You know, because he didn't really produce faithfulness. And that is a very sobering idea. So Jeroboam II, powerful king, but not so good. Uh, evil. <laughs> Number nine, what surprising prophet, I should say, shows up during the reign of Jeroboam II? Isaiah, Ezekiel, 
Hosea, Jonah. And it is D. Bob is correct. Oh, wait, wait, wait. That's wrong. That, I must have highlighted the wrong thing for my wife. My wife puts this up. I will accept responsibility. I probably highlighted the wrong thing. The answer is D, Jonah. So ignore what's on the screen. And uh, the answer is D, Jonah. And so it's interesting because these books have completely different origins, you know, where, where these books come from, where they're collected. And so it's fascinating when we find biblical material about people to learn a little bit about them. Number 10, which of the following was not a sin of Solomon? Was not a sin of Solomon. Too many wives, too much gold and silver, worshiping other gods, golden calf worship. And the answer is golden calf worship because that is the sin of Jeroboam which came after Solomon. Oh, he had problems, Solomon. Um, you know, would my wife be comfortable if I had a few wives, not too many wives? Now, she would say more than one is too many wives. <laughs> but I, I do like the way E.V. Hill put it. He says, I have two wives. One is in glory and one is here. And that is as close as they should get. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, what he uh, described. But I always thought that that was kind of funny because whenever he said that first statement, I have two wives, everyone asks, who did we just invite to preach at our church? <laughs> and then he finished the statement and then it was far more understandable. All right, with that in mind, how many got all 10 right with generous grading? Generous grading. Nine. Karen, that's excellent. These are not really easy quizzes. So the fact that you've got nine right, Wilson, how'd you do? You did better than usual. We'll leave that to itself because, you know, last week you got two right, this week you got three. And no, I'm kidding. <laughs> the, the truth is, anyone who takes this quiz and really gets six right or more, you were in the class because you wouldn't get too right in if you didn't take the class. And, you know, even if you handed this quiz to Pastor Nathan, I could pretty much guarantee he would not get, without looking at the passage again, probably more than six right. You know, because you have to refresh yourself with this material. Um, when I look at one of my old quizzes, you know, that we handed out four weeks ago, I have to think, what was the right answer to that, you know? So it, it's not like it stays fresh in the brain all the time. But I celebrate you folks for, uh, you know, coming up with this. And I hope you folks online, by the way, I always look at the comments after the class. And so if you want to tell me how great you did on the quiz, you're welcome to. And if you're wondering, what quiz? Where is there a quiz you go to the web, web page, click events, then click on groups, then type in kings and become a member of that group. And then it takes you to a page where we have the quizzes. And if you have doubts about what I just said, call the office someday or write Michelle at shelterrockchurch.com and she'll explain it to you because she's the one who posts it. Um, and we'll take it from there. All right. Tonight, you know, they're all interesting passages to me, but... Oh, first, my announcement for those coming late. I'm going to repeat it again. We are having class on Memorial Day. We are having class on Memorial Day. You don't have to come. I'll come by myself and film it, and you can watch it on Facebook. But this is so I finish my class of 2 Kings before I go on vacation at the end of June. So, again, just throwing it out there. So, story about my mom. Before my mother's stroke, she loved to read, loved to read. But there was a common theme of every book she read, every book. And, and she would find them in the library. She knew where these books were. And here, here's the theme. Young people fall in love, 
get saved, get married, have a baby. That's the, the every book, same storyline. Young people fall in love, get saved, get married, have a baby in roughly that order. And she, she's a hopeless romantic. She always was. And so even now, um, the cable went down last week. And, and, you know, when you can't walk and you can't do much, you know, cable's very important to you. I didn't even have cable in the house until she lived with me because now I have it for her. Um, but what were we going to do? So I, I set up um, uh, Amazon Prime through uh, the Internet because the Internet was still up. And I told Michelle, put on something Hallmark. And, you know, Hallmark is a mixed bag these days. But, you know, there was one that it was pretty obvious it was going to be a nice, clean cut love story. And so my wife pops that on. Well, I always put her to bed at 1030 at night. Always. That's it's like a clockwork. So I walk in the room and she can't talk, but she goes, mm, mm. you know, she wanted to finish that movie because, you know, the marriage didn't take place yet, you know, and it was a, a nice, sweet love story. I wish tonight I was telling you a nice, sweet love story. Tonight's story is about when they got divorced, and after the divorce, they got cancer, and then after the cancer, they died. There was no cure. I say that because tonight we read about the end of the northern kingdom of Israel, and tonight we read about Judah and one of its worst kings. And that's where we enter the story. And so to look at our maps of kings, so you can see this, you know, this is all the kings and virtually unreadable by anyone in the room. So I examine it a little closer. And that is from the beginning. And tonight, we are now crossing over. So you see on the bottom of the screen, Uzziah and Joash on the bottom of the, on the kings of Israel. A reminder, the reason why the kings of Israel key, are sliding over is because the dynasties keep ending. They keep killing each other off. Uh, evil begets evil. But now we're on now the bottom half of this. And we are on Ahaz on the Judah side and Hoshea in Israel. And if you know Hoshea, there's nothing under him. That's the end. Tonight, we come to the end of Israel. It's sad and unfortunate. The year is now 735 BC. 735 BC. Israel will come to an end as a nation. 722 BC. To give you a framework of how long Judah lasts beyond this, Judah will continue until the temple is destroyed in 585, 586 BC. So Judah's going to go on for another 120 years or so, but it's going to be coming to an end too. Because there's evil. I mean, and, and there's going to be judgment of God. So tonight we're looking at chapter 16 and 17. And we drop into our text. In the 17th year of Pekah, son of Ramalia, Ahaz, son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David, his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I want to show you. Uh, uh, let's see here. This is an inscription that was found in the year 1996. And it says, belonging to Ahaz, son of Yohatam, Jotham, king of Judah. Kind of cool. I mean, archaeology is such a new science. 
little pieces like this. 1996, that is within all of our lifetimes in this room, proof that this king existed. Now, we who believe the Bible, we don't have much problem believing that he existed. But in the secular world, they doubt almost everything in Scripture until they find something. And here's an example of we have evidence. Now, verse 3, he followed the ways of the kings of Israel and even sacrificed his son in the fire, engaging in detestable practices of the nations of the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burnt incense in high places on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. Now that last statement is a hyperbolic statement. It's, it's not saying that literally every tree, like we have a bunch of trees outside the church building. There wasn't an altar under every literal tree in Israel. His point is they were everywhere. It's like saying, if you hate McDonald's, McDonald's is like a rash on America. There's one everywhere. But there isn't one everywhere, but it feels like there's one everywhere. Well, little memory lane here. I've showed this picture to you before. This is an artist's depiction of Molech. Molech was a god you would heat up. It was an iron god. And you would heat it up until the arms were scorching red hot. And then you would place a baby. In this case, Ahaz placed his own son into the burning arms of Molech as a sacrifice. And you wonder why God gets angry when he sees these, and the word is in the Hebrew, detestable. It's a strong word. We understand why it's a strong word. Practices. We can understand why this takes place. But why these unwanted babies? Because they're worshiping Asherah, the sex god. And how do you worship Asherah? By having sex with prostitutes, temple prostitutes, that produces unwanted children. What do you do with the unwanted children? Have them, what was the phrase is used, pass through the fire. And that is into the arms of Molech. And so this is what is taking place in uh, his reign. Now, when it says the sins of Israel, there's one exception, and that is golden calf worship. Now, the reason why golden calf worship, which is a sin of Israel, is not one. The text doesn't say it overtly, but we know it uh, subtly. It's because to worship the golden calf would mean people from Judah would go to Bethel or Dan. And the king of Judah doesn't want them to do that. So they're not going to worship golden calves, but they are going to uh, do all the other sins, Asherah and uh, Molech. And, it, and it's sad. It's just tragic. So under this time frame, a, a battle arises. So then Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramalia, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem and besieged Ahaz, but they could not overpower him. At that time, Rezin, king of Aram, recovered Elath for Aram by driving out the other people of Judah. Edomites then moved into Elath and have lived there to this day. So let's look at some maps here. So on the map on the left, you look at the very bottom of the map and you will see just a little hint of water. That is Elath or modern day Elat, similar. I have the other map there, which is the extent of the Assyrian Empire. And that shows you a bigger picture. So you see on the very bottom, the Red Sea. And then if you go, it has a fork at the end of it. And the fork that bears to the right, that is the Gulf of Aqaba that we would call it today. And at the very end of that is Elat. And that Israel owns that to this day. And I think I share with you, when you're in Elat today, 
A little piece of it is owned by Saudi Arabia, a little piece of it is owned by Jordan, and a little piece of it is owned by uh, Israel. And it's, it's like, it's super close, but you can't get from one to the other. Um, the border's a fixed border, and uh, they don't allow that. So this map is important, the one with the Syrian Empire, because this is where you're going to see. Now I want you to see this little tiny circle, which is where Jerusalem is. So if you follow Elot up, you see this little circle? That's Judah. It's actually Judah a little bit later, next week. But before then, you see the Assyrian Empire. And the reason it has multicolors, they're invading at different stages. And that green color or darker green, I think it's green on here. Yes, that green color is what they're going to do today, at the end of class today. That's going to be the point of invasion. Um, they will take over. So um, Ahaz, this is verse 7, sent messengers to say to Tiglath Pilzer, king of Assyria, I am your servant and vassal. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Aram and the king of Israel. So on the other map, you can see the shaded area where it says Syria, and then you see Israel. Both of those nations, the northern kingdom of Israel and Assyria, also known as Aram, are attacking Judah. What is Judah going to do? Now, you've gotten to know Ahaz a little bit. Good king, bad king. Very bad king. Sacrifice his own son. There's only two kings of Judah who do that. Ahaz and a guy we haven't met yet, Manasseh. He's going to come later. But those are the two kings that cause their own child to pass through the fire. But what would a good king of Judah do? probably try to do ask God for help God help me and you know what a great king it's funny sometimes the apple can fall far from the tree and produce something good if your daddy was Ahaz could he produce a good king Hezekiah good king one of the best kings not perfect but a decent king, his daddy's Ahaz. Go figure. Which got my brain working because I taught through the entire book of Isaiah. And then I realized, wait a second. In the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah chapter 6, I saw the Lord high and exalted and the train of his garment filled the temple. Who was the descendant of Uzziah? Ahaz. Isaiah is the temple prophet. Now, every one of you in this room knows a prophecy that Isaiah gave to Ahaz. Every one of you knows it. I guarantee it. Isn't that pretty amazing? And you're thinking, Pastor Steve, I don't remember a prophecy that Isaiah gave to Ahaz, to which I say, yes, you do. You just don't put it together. You hear it every Christmas. So let me go and read the word of the Lord here. When Ahaz, this is Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Ramalia, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem. Now, you guys just read that in Kings. So we're hearing the same thing. But they could not overpower it. They didn't. They didn't win. They, I mean, he, he lost a lot, but they didn't conquer Judah. Now, the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, another name for Israel, you got to know your, your dictionary names. Ephraim is another name for Israel. So the hearts of Ahaz and the people were shaken as trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shear Jessup, and meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool 
on the road to the wanderer's field, say to him, be careful, keep calm, don't be afraid, do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Ramalia, Aram and Ephraim and Ramalia's son have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tabil uh, king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. Ready? It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus. The head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will, will too be shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Ramallah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. And again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to a test. Now, at this point, you're thinking, well, maybe that's a noble thing to say. But God is saying, test me on this. But God says, okay, you don't want to put me to a test? I'll tell you. I'm giving you the test. Then Isaiah said, hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey and he knows enough to reject the wrong and to choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring it on you and your people and on the house of your father, a time unlike since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Now, do you see every one of you has heard that prophecy, but you've heard it applying to Jesus. This is an example of double fulfillment of a prophecy. In Hebrew, the word a virgin shall conceive is a word that can mean literal virgin or young woman shall conceive. And Isaiah will have a child, Mahal Shalal Hajbaz. And isn't that a great name? Nobody uses that name for naming their kids. Mahal Shalal Hajbaz. You know, uh, the teacher's going through the roster and, and will Halal you know, <laughs> it's the kind of name teachers dread, you know, when, they, when they're looking at the roster. That's the first fulfillment. It's Isaiah's kid. The second kid, as rendered in Greek with a word that can only be translated actual virgin, is the way the word is used in the Greek in the New Testament. That's why you're seeing the power of the double fulfillment uh, taking place here. But in this, you see, Ahaz is receiving grace right now. God is going to say, I'm going to fight this battle for you. But when Ahaz hears this word from Isaiah, which is not recorded in 2 Kings, that's why Isaiah is helpful here. He does not trust the Lord. And so as an end result, what happens? Let me go over here, actually. I'll put that up. So as an end result, what happens? Verse 10, uh, excuse me, verse, verse uh, 8. And Ahaz took the silver and gold found in the temple of the Lord and in the treasuries of the royal palace and sent it as a gift to the king of Assyria. So I want you to get the picture of what is taking place here. So what you're finding is there's an epic battle taking place. Syria, up north, is coming down along with Israel, or Ephraim, to fight Judah. Uh, the Philistines are actually in on the deal too. And Judah thinks, I don't want to be uh, in this battle 
I have an idea. Who is the major power just to the north? Assyria. So this is the equivalent of Ahaz takes the gold and silver out of the treasuries of the temple, pays Assyria, and says, fight Israel and Aram. In other words, I'm paying you to do this. Um, President Biden made a comment this week, which was very powerful in its potential implications, uh, if I understood it correctly. I didn't read the articles completely, so if I'm missing something, but he said he would defend Taiwan. That's very, very interesting. Because that happens, that would mean China, who has interest in invading and taking over Taiwan, would have to go through the United States. That changes the whole spectrum. Now, why Biden would say that probably is to keep Taiwan from being invaded. In other words, keep the status quo. And that would be a reason why you would say something like that. But I'm giving that as an example because this small country, which I will equate with Taiwan, is asking a big country to come to our aid against another big country. And so that is my analogy here. So Judah being attacked, we got gold. I will take it out of the temple, pay Assyria. Assyria likes gold and Assyria takes the bait and decides to attack Aram. So here's what we read. Um, number nine, the king of Assyria complied by attacking Damascus, capturing it. He deported its inhabitants to Kerr and put resin to death. So we uh, look at the map again. You see Syria. You can see Damascus up there. Now conquered by Assyria. Then King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath Pilzer, king of Assyria. So what he is doing, he's saying, I'll be your vassal. I'll, I'll like honor you. You can count me in and, and I'll be your guy. And so that is what um, he's going to Damascus for. Basically, the kiss the ring of Tiglath Pils Pilser's finger. He saw the altar in Damascus and sent Uriah the priest a sketch of the altar with detailed plans for its excuse me, construction. So Uriah the priest built an altar in accordance with all the plans that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus and finished it before King Ahaz returned. Now, here's where I'm making the story. So, remember Uzziah. He walks into the temple and he decides, I am going to offer a sacrifice. And the high priest, Azariah, says, don't do this, king, don't do this. And all the priests are gathering around the king saying, don't do this, don't do this. But Uzziah's like, I am going to do it. I am king. So he starts offering the sacrifice. So leprosy breaks out on his forehead and they quickly rushed him out of the temple. And then the passage we read last week says, indeed, Uzziah wanted to get out of there quickly too. And for the rest of his reign, he reigned outside of Jerusalem because of his leprosy. Here is the difference. Azariah stood up for what should be done in the name of the Lord. Uriah, oh, here are plans to build a pagan altar next to the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, I'll take care of that for you. What are you thinking? You know, what is in your mind? You know, my mom, um, you know, you learn a lot from your parents. It's fascinating. But um, my grandpa was an odd duck. He was just an odd duck. I've talked about him in the past. If you want to read about how odd of a duck he is, you can Google him. He's a pretty famous person. His name is Bishop Homer Tomlinson. Just Google it. And you'll see him crowning himself king all over the world in the name of God. Um, in his 
mind. It was the way you uh, advanced the kingdom of God. But one of the things that he had was a, a flag of the church of God. So you know how like Christians have a Christian flag and you know things like that. Um, well, anyway, in his flag, if you can imagine it, it had these bars on the side. And he, you know, towards the end of his life, he has a very small church, but he's still doing extravagant things. He goes to my mother, who is a seamstress, and says, I want you to make a flag, but modify it. I want the flag now to have a closed end. In other words, the two angles touch each other on both sides, because the open end meant previously that the church is still open to receive new believers, but the closed end is that it is now finished and that the church is all the believers it needs. My mother told her father-in-law, no, <laughs> I'm sorry, dad, that's not the way I read the Bible. People are still coming to faith. I cannot close the bars on the flag. That's a tough thing for a young woman. My, my mother was in her 20s when she said this. And, and grandpa, he had traveled 100 countries, crowning himself king on the tarmac in, in what used to be called Peking. You know, I mean, very dynamic, charismatic figure. When he died, a thousand people came to his funeral. It's one of my first memories is going to his funeral and seeing, who was grandpa? You know, that all these people were coming and, and celebrating him. <coughs> but I look at my mom and her confidence to say to grandpa, no. I look at Uriah and his lack of confidence with his king. He builds a pagan altar next to the one Solomon's temple. What is he thinking? So you get some good leaders, you get some bad leaders. And, and that is the way it is. And so when the king came back from Damascus, verse 12, he saw the altar, he approached it and presented offerings on it. He offered up his burnt offering and grain offering, poured out his drink offering, splashed the blood of his fellowship offerings against the altar. As for the bronze altar that stood before the Lord, he brought it from the front of the temple, from between the new altar and the temple of the Lord and put it on the north side of the new altar. So he's now rearranging the furniture at the altar. Now, I want to point out, he's not destroying the temple of the Lord. He is doing what many of us do. We're practicing syncretism. What's syncretism? It's when you worship multiple gods. You know, like, for example, if you go to India, you can believe in Jesus because they have thousands of gods. You can add Jesus to the pantheon. Oh, he's a good one to add. Yeah, I worship Jesus too. And I worship this, 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 this. You know, you go through all the lists. That's syncretism. If you ever go to Tiberias in Israel, one of the places we sometimes take groups is a synagogue. And you go to the synagogue. It was built 200 AD. So it's, you know, after the time of Christ. And you could see the symbols of synagogue. But then in the center of the synagogue, you know what you can see? A circle with the signs of the zodiac. Now, the, the Jews worship the signs of the zodiac? They do not. Except 200 years after the time of Christ, some, some of them did. That's syncretistic religion, where you are kind of blending things. And truth be told, I don't want to know but I'm sure there's a percentage of people at Shelter Rock Church who check their horoscope regularly. They're very conscious of what month they were born in. I'm Aquarius, I'm this, I'm that. That's syncretistic. It's you're combining other belief systems into your belief systems. We've been going through these questions on Sunday morning. One of them was, is Jesus the only way? What do you guys think? Uh, how many think there are other ways? There are no hands up for those watching online. No, we believe by conviction. What does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, 
the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peter says to the Sanhedrin, there is no other name under heaven given among mankind by which we must be saved. That's Acts chapter 4. That is the scripture. Jesus is the only way. And so when we're seeing this, he's keeping the altar of the Lord, but I'm adding some other stuff here. I don't want to hedge my bets. You know, one of uh, a fun movie of years ago is The Mummy. Um, and in this movie, there's this character who doesn't want to hedge his bets. So he has a charm for like every possible faith. And when the mummy comes to life, he's showing him all his charms, hoping to like get the right God for this mummy. And he eventually comes to the Jewish star and the mummy says in, in uh, Egyptian, ah, he's a slave, meaning the Jews were slaves in Egypt. So he's like, you'll do. And he starts giving him instructions because he's, he's a slave. But I got a kick out of the scene where he's trying to like hedge his bets on all the possible gods that you know, might be available. And uh, we're going to bump into that again tonight, this idea that you got to appease certain gods in, in certain areas. So uh, we, we move on. Uh, as for verse 14, as for the bronze altar that stood before the Lord, he brought it to the front of the temple from between the new altar and the new temple. He put it on the north side of the new altar. Verse 15, King Ahaz then gave these orders to Uriah the priest, who we know is the man with a strong backbone. So, of course, Uriah is going to push back on this. Of course not. On the large new altar, offer the morning burnt offering and the evening grain offering. The king's burnt offering and his grain offering and the burnt offering of all the people in the land and their grain offering and their drink offering splash against the altar the blood from the burnt offerings to sacrifice. But I will use the bronze altar for seeking guidance. Now what is that about? This is probably the pagan practice of reading entrails. So you get a bull's liver and you look at the liver and you interpret it to see what the Lord wants you to do. We know that this was a practice among the pagans there. And the fact that he's going to this altar for seeking guidance, that's why we think he's reading entrails. You don't do that in Israel. You seek the prophet of the Lord. You don't read entrails. And so that is what they believe he's doing here, trying to read entrails. And so, um, uh, verse 16, Uriah the priest did as King Ahaz had ordered. He did as King Ahaz ordered. Interesting question for yourself. Don't raise your hand or anything, but have you ever been confronted to do something against your integrity. You know, I, it's easy to say, I would never do that when you're not being pressured and you might lose your job or your life, <clears throat> which, you know, losing your life is not a common thing here. But in his world, he could have lost his life. And, you know, are you willing to stand up against power? But that's really hard to do. You know, and as much as I could say, oh, I would never do that, it could be hard sometimes. You know, and, and some of us who maybe have done that from time to time in our life kind of look back and go, why did I do that? And you know what? It sometimes can be subtle. You know, it's not like I'm not a major thing. When I worked for Amtrak, the crew on one of the trains wanted every night to be ordered to stay up and work all night. And this is what I mean by that. So by contract, railroad contract, I'm supposed to let my coach attendants get a sleep, minimally four hours. So let's say you're one of the coach attendants, you're opening at the train station in Albany, New York, you're opening the doors, and Albany, New York is like 11 o'clock at night, and you let the people in, and once you close the doors, between Albany and Buffalo, which is a good long ride, but it's all, it's all midnight stops, 
the crew are supposed to be able to go to the dorm, get some sleep. But the crew members, number of them, they wanted to stay up to get paid because they get overtime. So let's say they were getting $25 an hour normally, but if I would initial their timesheet, they would get for that period $45 an hour extra because they were kept up. Well, I wouldn't do it because I said, I don't need you. The conductors are there for that. The con we get very few people on. The conductors can bring them to the room. But the conductor is technically over even me. Even though I supervise the crew, by federal law, the conductor is in charge of the train. So he would sign the timesheet. And I would yell at him in the next morning, why are you signing these timesheets? You're supposed to do this. I have the authority to do that. So then I would go to his boss, located in Albany, and said, your conductors every night are signing timesheets for my crew. I don't have the authority to overrule the conductor, but you do. And if you don't, I'm going to your boss. Now, my point in this, that was a pain in the rump. That's, in, in other words, it's intimidating. So I'm going to the conductor and saying, you can't keep my crew up, but my crew want to be kept up. They want to make the money. So I have the crew disliking me. I have the conductor disliking me because I'm going to his boss now. And then his boss doesn't like me because I'm having another boss over him come to him. You can see what smiles greeted me when I arrived in Albany, because that's where we picked up this crew in Albany. And, um, you know, I would go, to, are we good tonight? Yeah, we'll be good tonight. You know, but I could see the nastiness and meanness, you know, pouring, pouring out of them. All I can say is that was not easy. And I think most of my position, we call ourselves onboard chiefs, that's our title, just gave in. It isn't worth it. Even though we knew the policy, they were like, yeah, it's just money. Let the employees have their money, you know, and, and that was it. But I knew what the organization wanted and I pursued it. All I'm saying, it's not easy if you're trying to do. And, and you know what? There would be, if I had some crew members here, they probably would have said, I'm not sure you were doing the right thing. I need this money to feed my family, you know, or something like that, you know these things get murkier as they go on. Um, all I'm just saying, let's cut a little bit of slack. He's wrong. He's absolutely wrong. But I kind of understand human nature to preserve your tail, you know, when the king is, is saying this. So we, we go on in our text, verse 17. Um, king Ahaz cut off the side panels, removed the basins, from the movable stands, he removed the sea from the bronze bowls and supported it and set it on a stone base. He took away the Sabbath canopy that had been built at the temple and removed the royal entryway outside the temple of the Lord in deference to the king of Assyria. In other words, he's seeking to, Ahaz now is bending his knee to Assyria by worshiping these pagan gods. Now, some of the, I wish I could show you pictures of what he's doing. We don't really understand exactly what's being described here. For example, this Sabbath canopy, we're not sure what that is. We think that was built after the time of Solomon. And so this whole paragraph is speculative to us. But if you could just picture this one overall principle, he's rearranging the furniture. As for the other events of the reign of Ahaz and what he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Ahaz rested with his ancestors and was buried with them in the city of David. He, and, and Hezekiah, his son, succeeded him as king. When I read that last phrase, it's one of those things that it's jarring. Hezekiah? Good king? You came from him? You know, it, it's, it's interesting. If your dad was the Reverend Moon, and you're applying for a church position as a pastor. I'm not sure how many evangelical churches want to 
interview you. But the truth is, maybe you don't follow the ways of Reverend Moon. You know, maybe you got your act together. Maybe you're following God appropriately. But it's, it's, it is surprising how bad people can have great children and great people can have not so great kids. It's, it's life. Um, wish, wish it didn't always work that way. Actually, when it comes to good kids, I guess I'm glad it worked that way. Okay, chapter 17, Hoshea, last king of Israel. Now, this is, when, it, when I remember I told you, you know, this is not the Hallmark Channel tonight. Now we're going to uh, the end of Israel. The year, approximately 723, 722, is now when a lot of this stuff is taking place. In the 12th year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, son of Elah, became king of Israel in Samaria, another name for Israel. He reigned for nine years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not like the kings of Israel. Now, this is a fascinating statement. I looked this up in Bible dictionaries. I looked it up in multiple books in the Bible. Hoshea. We don't know what he did different than the other kings. But here is his epitaph. Hoshea. Not as bad as his father. <laughs> That's about it. Not as bad as daddy. And so we don't know exactly why he is not considered as bad. But here's what we think. We think it's because he seems to be a patriot. Meaning he wants to break free from Assyria. Because after, remember... Judah paid the Assyrians to put Israel and Damascus under its thumb. He succeeded. Hoshea is a vassal king of Assyria, but Hoshea wants to break free from that, and he doesn't want to be under the thumb. So the speculative thought is that's what makes him slightly less evil. At least he wanted independence for Israel. Um, is that the answer? We don't know. But I, I think it's funny when you think his epitaph, not as bad as his daddy was. You know, <laughs> whatever that exactly means. So Shalamanser, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hoshea. So sometimes it's fun to see this is, uh, well, actually, we're going to come across that a little later. There we are. There's Shalamanser, the fifth. So... I always find it cool when you're reading something in the Bible and we actually haven't, and I, this is not an artist's depiction. This is an ancient relic. So he probably looked a little like this. So Tiglath Pilzer dies. This guy comes to power. This guy comes to power. Do you know how um, when leaders change in a nation, Sometimes other nations try to perceive, is this guy weak or is he strong? And if he's perceived as weak, then nations get adventurous. They take their chances. They see what's going to happen. And so that seems to be what happened. Tiglath Pilzer, tough cookie. But the new guy's around. You know, maybe he'll be a wimp. And so that seems to be what is occurring. Uh, this is Tiglath Pilzer, by the way. Um, I showed this uh, a few weeks ago. So we uh, come into the text. Therefore, uh, verse 4, Shalomanser seized... Uh, I went too far. Uh, Shalomanser, verse 3, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hoshea, who had been Shalomancer's uh, vassal and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria discovered Hoshea was a traitor, for he had sent envoys to So, king of Egypt. By the way, we're not positive who So, king of Egypt is. It's not a, a wording, a spelling that we're familiar with. 
and he no longer paid tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. So this is his thought. I want to stop being under the thumb of Assyria. Assyria. So I want to make a deal with the other powerful nation, Egypt, and I'll pay tribute to them, get Assyria off my case. But uh, Shalmanzir uh, heard that and says, that's the end of you. And so seized him and put him in prison. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, and laid siege to it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Assyria, captured Samaria. Historically, it's the year 722 BC and deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Hala, Gozen, Habor River, and the towns of the Medes. So what you're uh, seeing on this map here is where what's happening. So the people of Israel are now being distributed in different parts of the Assyrian Empire. Now, Assyria did this because they figured it makes the nation weak because you're taking a lot of the cream out and distributing them. But it turns out they were sowing for themselves their own seeds of destruction. How so? Because they're they did this with nations all over. They're putting people that hate Assyria everywhere in Assyria. So this is actually why the Assyrian Empire eventually collapsed to the Babylonians. You put people who hate you everywhere in your kingdom, and then suddenly your whole kingdom wants to revolt. So this distribution caused lots of problems. Here's another little thing. This is your roots of the Samaritans because the Samaritans are a half-breed people, if you will. They are the remnants of the people of Israel combined with the people that the Assyrians are now moving from other places to them. And so they form, again, a syncretistic religion. And so, verse 7. All this took place, oh, uh, I should say, this whole next section is, let's explain a principle of why God did this. So this is one of the rare moments that the author of the book of 2 Kings is going to give us the why. Now, you kind of know the why already, but he's going to make it very specific. All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who brought them out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That statement is saying, remember where you came from. Remember where you came from. When you remember the victories that God gave you in the past, it inspires you to keep following the Lord in the present. And so, yes, tell your stories about how God healed you in 1974. Tell your story about how God brought this about in you know, such and such a year. Keep reminding yourselves of those stories because when you're in a difficult time, you remember, oh yes, some trust in horses, some in chariots, I'm trusting in the Lord. You know, because he was faithful in the past, he'll, he'll be faithful again. Um, they worshiped other gods. They followed practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city. Now that statement is from little things to big things. Watchtower to an entire city. They built themselves high places in all their towns. Now in this case, high places is worship of anything. It's a general statement. This is not just worship of the Yahweh in the backyard. This is worshiping of all your pagan gods in your high place. How do I know that? Context tells me that in terms of, you know, what's going on. They set up sacred stones and Asherah poles in, on every high hill and under every spreading tree. At every high place, they burn incense as the nations 
whom the Lord had driven out before had done. They did wicked things that aroused the Lord's anger. They worshiped idols, though uh, the Lord had said, you shall not do this. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, turn from your evil ways, observe the commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your ancestors to obey, that I delivered you, uh, delivered to you through my servants and prophets. But they would not listen. They were as stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and covenants he made with their ancestors and statutes he had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. I thought that phrase is very, very powerful. You are who you worship. You worship a worthless idol, what do you become? Worthless. Very, very strong statement. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. Here is another interesting statement. Can people tell a difference between us and our neighbors? Or do we look identical to them? Like, are all the Christians watching the Game of Thrones and all the pagans watching the Game of Thrones? And, you know, I'm saying that because Game of Thrones is all this risque stuff in it, you know, all this kind of stuff. I mean, is there any difference between us and them? Do we have, you know, things that make us different? You know, I think there should be, we're not going to do this perfectly. And by the way, your neighbors use a cell phone, I use a cell phone. That doesn't automatically mean all things your neighbors do are bad. Your neighbors cut their lawn, I cut my lawn. That doesn't mean it's, it's bad. But does your neighbor give to the poor like you give to the poor? You should have a distinctive. Does your neighbor, you know, act, exercise appropriate faithfulness to their spouse? You know, and you're, are you different that way? Do you encourage your kids to come to church with you? You know, these are the things that would make you distinctive. I don't think it's an insult if your neighbor tells another neighbor referring to you, yeah, I think they're a Bible thumper. Good. Let them say it. You know, he's, oh, you know, if you want to rob their house, go Sunday morning. They're never home. They're always at church. You know, those would be good things, you know, to, to hear. Not that I want anyone's house to be robbed, but, you know, can people see a difference? Um, verse 16, they forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves. This is the Bethel and Dan sin. And the Asherah pole. They bowed down to all the starry hosts and they worshiped Baal. So he's going through all the gods that they followed. By the way, one god I forgot to show you is this is, uh, this is not a god. This is a seal of Hoshea, the last king of Israel that was found. Again, found very recently. But that's kind of cool. This is a seal from that time of Hoshea. And this is the god Hadad that Azariah, excuse me, Ahaz brought from Damascus. I forgot to show that to you. So as I'm going through all these gods, this is what he brought down from Damascus. That was the god. It's, it's a god of weather. And by the way, almost all these gods are god of weather in some degree because they want it to rain. They're trying, you know, to get the crops to grow. So weather is a, a dominant theme. But, um, you know, we have this remnant. Um, they sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire, verse 17. They practiced divination, sought omens, and sold themselves uh, to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left. And even Judah did not keep the commands of the Lord their God. They followed the practices of Israel that, had been, that Israel had introduced. Therefore, the Lord rejected all the people of Israel. He afflicted them and gave them into the hands of plunderers until he thrust them from his presence. 
one of the struggles we have when we look at this is God uses a more evil people to judge his people. The whole book of Habakkuk is Habakkuk wrestling with that. He says, God, are you going to help out? Chapter one. Chapter two, God says, I'm going to set your ears on edge. I'm actually going to send and more evil people to punish you. To which Habakkuk says, how can you do that, Lord? And, Jesus, and God says, because they have been unfaithful. And Habakkuk ends, though the fig tree does not blossom, though there's no fruit on the vine, says there's no uh, cows in the stalls, yet I will trust in the Lord my God. You know, he, in the end of Habakkuk is, even when things seem against you, still trust in the Lord. That's the whole point of Habakkuk. But that is kind of a tough thing to swallow that God is now judging with this very evil people. Verse 21, when he tore Israel from the house of David, they made Jeroboam, son of Nebat, their king. Jeroboam enticed Israel away from following the Lord, caused them to commit a great sin. What is a great sin? Worshiping a golden calf in Dan and Bethel. The Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam, did not turn away from them, until the Lord removed them from his presence as he warned through his servants, the prophets. So the people of Israel were taken from their homeland into exile in Assyria. They are still there. Sad statement. All right, now the, the last uh, section here. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, Serevim, and settled them in the towns of Samaria. And so you can see, um, you know, on the map, I'm not sure if I have another map of this too. No, I don't have that one. So this one, basically from various areas, you can see most of those places mentioned here, Babylonia, Hamath, so they're bringing those people now into that area to replace the Israelites. They took over Samaria and lived in its towns. When they first lived there, they did not worship the Lord. So he sent lions among them and killed some of the people. It was reported to the king of Assyria. The people you deported and resettled in the towns of Samaria do not know what the God of the country requires. He sent lions among them, which are killing them off, because the people do not know what he requires. Then the king of Assyria gave this order. Have one of the priests you took captive from Samaria go back to live there and teach the people what the God of the land requires. So one of the priests who had been exiled from Samaria came to live in Bethel, and taught them how to worship the Lord. Nevertheless, each national group made its own gods in several towns where they settled and set them up in shrines the people of Samaria had made at high places. The people of Babylon made Sukkoth, Benoth, those of Kutha made Nergal, those from Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nebaz and Tartak, and the Seravites burned their children in the fire as they sacrificed Ad Ramelech and Anamelech, the gods of Seravim. Now, we don't know who these gods are. This is an example of we, we're still digging, we haven't found these guys yet, you know, in terms of who these guys are. They worship the Lord but they also appointed all sorts of their own people to officiate for them as priests in the shrines of the high, at the high places. They worshiped the Lord, but they also served their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations from which they had been brought. That is syncretism. They're trying to do appease God who they feel sent lions to, you know, get them. But I think the purpose of the lions is not to bring people to say, hey, you know, make me one of your gods. No, it is to say, I am the 
only God. But the king of Assyria is just trying to be practical here. You know, let me bring uh, some priests, a priest from their own. Maybe we can fix this. The Lord demands exclusive worship. That's your big point here. The Lord wants to be worshiped alone. He doesn't want to be competing with other things in our lives. Verse 34, to this day, they persist in their former practices. They neither worship the Lord nor adhere to the decrees and regulations, the laws and commands that the Lord gave to the descendants of Jacob, whom he named Israel. When the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites, he commanded them, do not worship any other gods or bow down to them, serve them or sacrifice to them, but the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt with mighty power and outstretched arm is the one you must worship. To him you must bow down, to him offer sacrifices. You must always be careful to keep the decrees and regulations, the laws and commands he wrote for you. Do not worship the other gods. Do not forget the covenant I have made with you. Do not, and do not worship other gods. Kind of a little redundant there. Rather, worship the Lord your God it is he who will deliver you from the hand of all your enemies. They would not listen, however, but persisted in their former practices. Even while these people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their ancestors did. All right, that ends this section. That ends Israel. There is no more northern kingdom of Israel. The year 722. And now we're going to turn to the remaining kingdom, which is Judah. And we come to one of the best kings of Judah, Hezekiah. But that will be on Memorial Day, in which we are meeting for those chosen few who choose the Bible over hot dogs. I'm being sarcastic. You enjoy your Memorial Day. But if you want to come, we're teaching away here. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the chance to uh, go through your word. But Father, it's really sober. This challenge, are we going to be syncretistic? Are we going to choose, I'm going to follow Jesus and whatever else is on our list. Father, I think of that old chorus, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I pray that is our prayer. I pray that is our goal. I pray that is our desire. And that in the end, we might be a people found to be holistic in heart in our worship of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.